Um, thank you so much for joining us for the Women Leaders in Corporate Social Responsibility, a Force for Good panel discussion. My name is Sophia Mirabella, and I'm a first year full-time MBA student at UCLA Anderson, and I've had the pleasure of putting together today's panel discussion. The panel will include 40 to 45 minutes of discussion, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Please use the CVENT platform to submit your questions for the panelists and upvote any questions that you would like to be asked. The Zoom chat for the session will be disabled, so if you are submitting a question, please do so in the CVENT platform. Um, if you are submitting a question and are not comfortable coming off mute and turning on your video to ask the question directly to the, to the panelists, please submit your questions anonymously. I will be calling on audience members to join the stage with our panelists during the Q&A. I'd now like to introduce Phoebe Wood, who will be moderating today's discussion. Phoebe Wood is a UCLA Anderson alumni who held a 24-year international career in finance, has started a consulting practice to advise and invest in early stage startups, and serves as a board of directors member for various corporations. Phoebe is deeply committed to furthering education opportunities, enjoys mentoring young professional women, and making a positive impact in her community. We are honored to have her here with us today. Phoebe, I'll turn it over to you to introduce the panel. Yep, Sophia, thank you. And welcome everybody. We are delighted to have you. Um, we have prepared for you today um, a um, tremendous group of women who are going to talk about their definition of corporate social responsibility. We are describing this as a force for good. We are going to be listening from listening to high ranking executives who have built and have grown successful CSR initiatives within their own companies. So we have with us, and I'll let uh, this will not take away from what they're going to tell you the Chief Sustainability Officer of Comcast. We have VP Multicultural Audience Engagement at Walt Disney Studios, also Google Entertainment Industry Educator in Chief, and we have the Head of Social Impact. I didn't, at Dave. So they're gonna tell you a little bit more about themselves, and then we're gonna get into some of the questions. So first, um, it's over to you, Susan Jin Davis, welcome. Thank you. It's really great to be on um, this panel because I love the juxtaposition of women and force for good. I mean, it's to me, it's just, you know, so, sort of synonymous. Uh, so uh, Susan Jen Davis, I'm actually former chief sustainability officer of Comcast NBC Universal. Um, I had the, the great honor to be able to establish uh, the first office of sustainability for that corporation and just to be able to look at how we can be better citizens of the world, how we can do better for our communities, how we can do more for our employees, for our customers. I mean, it's just an opportunity that I, I really could not give up. Um, I've also spent my career doing um, CSR related um, work, which is my life's passion. Um, uh, I am very passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I worked tirelessly um, in that area for Comcast and BC Universal. Let me just turn it over to Julianne from here. I think you got the got the idea, and I'm really glad to be here. Great, thank you. Uh, well, thank you all for being here. Um, and as Susan, it's fun to intersect uh, with somebody else from the Comcast NBC Universal uh, universe. Uh, so, um, hi everyone, Julianne Kramit. Uh, I'm uh, formerly vice president of uh, multicultural audience engagement, the Walt Disney Studios. Um, I left that role about two months ago. Um, I built up the function from the ground up of uh, creative inclusion um, and storytelling work um, at the studio across Marvel, Lucas, Pixar, Disney, live action, Disney animation, then Fox and Searchlight when that merger happened, as well as the stage play group um, and uh, built it from uh, the ground up now to a team of 10 uh, and growing. Uh, and uh, and the practice was integrative between content and uh, people and culture. Uh, before that, I had stints at Google, at NBC Universal and Comcast, um, and uh, started my career at Pixar. Um, I'm a really proud Puerto Rican and Cuban American uh, raised outside of Atlanta, Georgia, where I am back now uh, living um, and am consulting full time. I have a brand new uh, consultancy company in the diversity, equity and inclusion space called Collective Moxie uh, because I believe change takes our collective moxie. Uh, and, um, and with that, I'm really excited to be here today to talk about sort of the DEI or diversity, equity and inclusion lens or justice lens on the ideas of, of social responsibility, um, which are so intertwined. So really, really excited uh, to be here with this fabulous group of women. 
Julianne, thank you. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Phoebe. And I'm I'm so excited to be here. We um, had a call before this and I was just like, oh, I'm so excited for Friday to, to actually go live with these amazing women. Um, but as you know, my name is Lauren Wampa. Um, my pronouns are she, her, Beyonce, until Beyonce sues me and tells me I can't do that anymore. Um, <laughs> I am currently the head of social impact at a fintech company based in LA called Dave. Um, and basically we are helping to um, build financial products that collect, that uh, you know, improve and move forward America's kind of collective potential. Um, we're disrupting the kind of traditional banking system that has been woefully predatory, woefully um, discriminatory, and we're providing access to um, low cost, transparent banking services um, or financial services, quite frankly, um, to so many people who have not been able to, to count on their banks um, in the past. Um, I took my, my role in life is to come to companies and to help them understand how to operationalize impact and um, do so in a way that is deeply integrated across the functions of the organization um, and really move them to a place kind of beyond some of the more traditional conceptions of corporate social responsibility, which we can talk about in a little bit. Um, I came to this uh, role about a year ago, so right before the pandemic hit, so I had about six weeks in the office and then bam, COVID was like, nope, no more. Um, and before then, I was I head up. Um, I was the head of social impact at Headspace, um, where I helped to kind of build and stand up that um, division of the company as well. So I'm constantly looking for companies that are inherently mission driven, um, that are building these inherently impactful products, and helping them really build the systems and infrastructure to um, lead with impact, lead with customer centricity. Um, and aside from my nine to fives, um, I do a lot of this, a lot of speaking, writing, and also advising for um, startups here in Los Angeles. So thank you so much. I'm so excited for this conversation. It's going to be good. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Okay, um, next, what we're going to do is we're going to ask each one of you to talk about this topic. What does corporate social responsibility mean to you? Many people are interpreting it quite differently. Even industries have, have different focus on it. So I think we'll go in the same order this time that I introduced you. So Susan, if you'll lead off, followed by Julianne and Lauren. What does corporate social responsibility mean to you? And let's all say a prayer that my internet stays on for my answer. Um, so thank you for that, for the prayer. Um, so what I think it means is it is about social good, which by the way, is business good. So there's this uh, Buddhist meme out there where a student is asking uh, her teacher, what should we be doing for others? And the teacher says, there are no others. And what that means to me is that we're all connected. We are all one. We are all one community. So as a member of the world's community, you know, I truly believe that corporate social responsibility is about doing our, and when I say our, I mean a corporation's part, to contribute to a better world, being responsible for solving the globe's biggest problems, um, and walking as gently as possible on this precious earth, all of which is making this world more sustainable for everyone. So what I specifically mean by that is understanding our environmental impact and looking at real ways to reduce our impacts or emissions, um, investing in our communities such, such that they are productive, thriving, fair, just, um, doing anti-racism work, um, empowering our employees to do good, but also so they do well. So dedicating ourselves to, to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and working in partnership with others because we can't do it alone. Individuals can't do it alone. Corporations can't do it alone. So private, public, community partnerships to address the biggest challenges that we are faced with, poverty, hunger, um, all sorts of inequalities, uh, the lack of access, um, being part of the community. Remember, there are no others, not just doing what's right for your company, for your employees, for your customers, but, but really what's right for everybody and for the world. So that is my view of, of CSR, and I feel that there is a lot of work that we all need to do, but I also see a lot of glimmers of hope in how many are joining into this community space of doing good. Julianne? Oh my gosh, following Susan. Now that was a heck of an answer. I don't even know what to add to it, but I'm... But, but plusing all that, plus one, right? Plus a thousand to all of what you just said, Susan. I think for me, you know, thinking about it as an equity um, and inclusion practitioner, right? Uh, very specifically is 
um, as we think about what it means to uh, do good, what it means to have impact in this world and to think in the collective, because I couldn't agree with you more, we're all part of one fabric uh, of humanity, um, is um, how do we also do that while recognizing the differences that exist between and among us that are beautiful, they're actually not to be ignored, they're to be celebrated. Um, and that then how do we find the strength um, of change and of moving the big issues forward together in the recognition of that difference. That for me is sort of, even when I talked about the name of my company, Collective Moxie, that's sort of where it comes from, which is the idea that it's in our coalition building, in our collective recognition of each other and the beauty and uniqueness that each other brings. It's in that diversity that actually we move the change forward. And so for me, when I think about what does social responsibility mean, it means that. Um, it means that action on a daily basis and then connected to the biggest problems of any of our time, whatever that might mean. And in our world and time right now, there are many. Uh, and, um, and if we don't get them solved, we might end up killing ourselves in the process. And, and not to be dire about it, but I think there's a there is a, 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 you know, an, a, a speed to this through which we have to do it. Um, and speaking specifically around climate and sustainability work, I don't think we're gonna have a choice. And so I think what excites me, I'm hopeful like you, Susan, in this moment is um, that you're seeing so many people dive in and we have to. Um, and there's kind of this moment of no going back now, which I think is really exciting. And, and quite frankly, the pandemic, we're gonna talk about this later a bit more, but the pandemic I think has accelerated that notion even more, which makes me extremely helpful. There's no going back to whatever quote unquote normal was. And by the way, that normal wasn't working for most people. Um, when you look at it from that justice inclusion lens, it's all about what's the new normal that we're building and what's the beauty of that we wanna build. And I think social responsibility sort of sits at the center of that notion too. And I'm excited to keep unpacking that as, as we're talking. Over to you, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I'm, thank goodness I was on mute because I just kept going, mm-hmm, yep, mm-hmm. <laughs> so just again, just, yeah, times a billion to, to everything you both said. Um, and I, I, you know, just even hearing you all talk about how you define um, you know, corporate social responsibility and impact, it's really inspiring because um, it is so, uh, we've, we've progressed so much beyond kind of what it what it used to be. You know, corporate social responsibility used to be this, this afterthought, this thing that happened, um, no matter how you got your profits or, you know, you could be selling cigarettes to kids or polluting, you know, the rivers in Flint, Michigan, and then write a check to a children's hospital and feel like you're you were done and that just cannot be the way that we do we we you know position corporate social responsibility anymore it has to be much more integrated than that we have to hold corporations in the private sector accountable um in a, in a way that we just haven't yet you know done before kind of this pre uh you know covid 2020 moment that we've seen to your point julianne that we, we can't move you know we can't go backwards from um and i just appreciate that you know, we, we can think beyond some of the archaic structures and rigid structures that kind of used to hold us back in terms of what is it, what it, what did it mean? Um, where you have companies that, you know, yes, they should be thinking about their supply chain and whether or not they're um, disrupting local economies, but they also should be thinking about what their board governance looks like and who they're, who's on their leadership and, um, and boards and, uh, you know, leadership opportunities within the corporate and the company and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I just think just that movement beyond kind of what it used to be and that status quo is huge. Um, and I also think it's important when we think about what does it look like kind of in real time and in, in, in real life is, um, and you know, how we're actually going about doing this work is that, you know, it really, these, these, issues are complex and how we're solving the issues are also complex. So, you know, there's never going to be this kind of turnkey solution to, you know, whatever Julianne's doing at, you know, her and her work um, isn't necessarily going to be what works at my organization. And so we have to be so thoughtful and imaginative to think about how can my particular company, my particular product, my particular team, you know, based on where we're located, what type of customers we have, how are we uniquely solving for a problem? Um, and that might mean, you know, you can't solve every problem. You know, if we're in, uh, I'm in fintech right now and we're working on helping people get to a place from, you know, financial precarity to financial health. So, you know, while we are thinking about things like sustainability and environmentalism and things like that, because there's an environmental justice component to a, a huge proportion of the um, customers that we have, um, we have to be thinking about what specifically works and makes the most sense for our particular company. Um, so it's just this really, um, 
this this exciting new world that uh, begs the question of you know what can your company what can your organization do in a way that actually moves the needle and isn't um, kind of taking us back to that kind of status quo. And then the last thing I'll say, because um, as you can tell, we're really excited about talking about this stuff, and we could talk about this stuff all day long. Um, but the last thing I'll say is just you know. I, I'm excited to see more and more um, a world in which we don't have to have this tension between, you know, profit and purpose or doing right by stakeholders other than our shareholders. Um, we, I can't tell you how many times people have asked me to write a business case for the work that I do. And I'm like, the business case is that just build a better business. And that's just that, that's just that, that's just the moral imperative. We just have to do it. And so it shouldn't be that hard. And so, and what that, forces us to do also is it forces us to center communities and people who have traditionally been oppressed, other, marginalized, left behind, and centering them to help us find the solutions. And when you think about that in terms of what equity looks like, when you think about that in terms of what justice looks like, it really forces the private sector to be involved and engaged in conversations that they've not been able, you know, they've not been a part of um, previously. So it's a, it's a really exciting time um, to see how this is all progressing. So. Well, you've done a wonderful job introducing us to this concept of what's the role of the corporation, you know what I mean, in really ma having making a positive change, do you know what I mean, for society. So you you started that. Um, Julianne or Susan, do you want to follow up on that sort of the role of the business, role of business? Um, after all, we are here um, at um, UCLA Anderson. And what's the role of business, do you know what I mean, in making positive change for society? following Absolutely. up on Lauren's said. I'm happy to jump in on that one also because Lauren, I just, I was I was wanting to kind of um, respond because what you, the last piece of what you said, by the way, home run on every level, um, just sharing the love right back, um, was um, that uh, centering of community in solution building, making and change work um, that also actually becomes the centerpiece of your business in so many ways is a very new thing for corporate America. And I think this is a really interesting place where business can sit that's quite new. And um, just thinking about own example, you know, we want to share some case studies today too, is um, when I was at Disney, we, we started doing it and the animation studio had sort of started this process with Moana, but it was the idea of how are we actually bringing community partners into the storytelling process and story development process at an early stage so that we're having constant and consistent communication about a story, an arena, a message that is directly connected to a particular community or set of communities or intersections of communities. And what creatively came out of those conversations was unlocking in so many ways. Um, so much of what you saw in the film Moana, which sort of started and kicked off that process, um, you know, was from those conversations, right? Um, we did it also with Aladdin. We've done it with uh, so many other projects in my time at Disney and continue Soul is Soul and Raya and the Last Dragon are some of the most recent examples. And I think what is really, um, I think interesting and groundbreaking about that centering is that it also, um, as long as you have the storytellers at the front end of that storytelling mechanism who are from the communities, they then also don't have to feel the responsibility of being the sole representative of their community in that process. The centering actually starts to do a lot of things um, and it creates community-based storytelling which actually starts to untell narratives that either have been told by ourselves or by companies a lot of the time into the world that have created so much of the prejudice, the hate, the assumptions that are existing between people. And actually, when you think about it from a business and storytelling standpoint, there is a deep responsibility to untell those narratives. And the centering of community in this work begins that process in a very deep and meaningful way in my mind. Um, and that's why I've always said it's a yes and. It's about representation in terms of who's telling the story, but it's also about the community centering and the community engagement as part of that process. It cannot just be a one-way street anymore. And that um, is, you know, Lauren, just building up what you said, so exciting. And also I think a profound role that business can play in this, especially in undoing those narratives they help to create in the first place. Very powerful from FinTech to you know media. How about over in your world, Susan? I love that. I love what the two of you have said. And just continuing on the storyline side, it's also about you know telling the stories that have never been told 
that aren't even known, you know, the so-called American stories that, you know, aren't even seen as American. And I, I don't have to tell those of you, you know, who are Asian American here uh, or not that, you know, we are suffering from ignorance and racism and, and a forever foreigner status that has created a lot of hatred and hate crimes and, and murders um, based on stereotypes, based on media portrayals or the lack of information that in fact, we are American, as American as anyone. And in fact, have had a long history of racism, discrimination, and hate crimes that nobody knew about. They think this is new. It's not new. So I love, I love the idea of unveil, unveiling stories and telling the full narrative of, of the American story. Um, but I really think it comes down to what is the asset that the company brings to the forefront and leveraging that asset. In the case of Disney, NBC Universal, it's about the storytelling. In the case of the Comcast side, it could be around digital connections. You know, we're already really good at providing high speed internet access and great entertainment over that. Well, why can't we bridge a digital divide then? Um, so there's that piece. The other piece is that we buy a lot of stuff. So why can't we use some of the money we're buying stuff with and empower uh, black owned businesses, women owned businesses, businesses that are not usually the ones that, that rise up when the economy rises up, that are often forgotten or funded. So why can't we use our funding to be able to bridge that divide and, and fill that gap? Um, we, we hire a, a lot of people. So why can't we begin to make more equal the workplace so that all people have an equal chance uh, at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that, that, it, that, that we make a purposeful attempt to diversify our ranks and to, to, to again, bridge that gap and to address that inequality. Um, and, and I also think it's also about the money that, that we have. We make money, let us invest money into things that will solve these problems, um, whether it is food insecurity, um, whether it is anti-racism work, justice work, civil rights, human rights work, whatever it is that we can use our ledges for, I think we need to do that. And it comes back to us because it is those people in the community that are, are, are us. I mean, if someone hadn't invested in me, I wouldn't have been in corporate America. So it feeds itself, it, it grows, and it creates a better place for everybody. So that, that's some of the things I think the companies can do. Well, this is profound. You know, whether you're integrating it into everything, you're centering it around the stories, or whether or not you're asking, what is the asset that the company brings? Try to distill each of your profound comments into a, a, a short phrase. Um, we're about ready to move on to our second topic, unless anyone wants to add in anything. This is, I think, um, you're you're quite excellent. But I'll give you one quick chance before we move on to the next topic. Just really quickly, because I just I love this conversation, and just on that topic of this undoing and this unlearning, I think it's so important to note how. Um, the personal work that has to happen on an individual level in order to make that systemic change and that systemic and organizational change that happens are so deeply intertwined. And we, ha we have to all think about, you know, how are we all complicit in maintaining the status quo or causing harm or causing oppression or, um, you know, preventing progress in some sort of way? And therefore, how are we all accountable and how are we all responsible? And so when I, when I do the work at my, you know, in the roles that I have and the organizations I work with, um, it, you you really can't start to really, you know, shift the tides in a, in a really uh, meaningful way without actually creating spaces within your organization for people to safely do that really deeply personal um, work of unlearning and undoing. And so I just wanted to call that out too, because you can't have that systemic change at an organizational level without like creating space and holding people accountable to do that, that deeply inter in personal work as well. Lauren, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, we're gonna to shift to a different concept here. Um, and that is about metrics and accountability because as people, uh, corporations continue to produce their corporate social responsibility reports or their ESG metrics, um, it's beginning to wonder like, um, it feeds into this old adage that we are taught um, what gets measured gets managed. And that's sort of a deep business sort of concept that is there. So let's just take that apart a little bit. What metrics have you used in your world that help, you know, either to, to create a successful program or to make sure that the company is moving forward on, you know, in the, in the um, pursuit that you want it to do? It's especially 
true today in ESG, but it can also be broadened to CSR. So um, we'll start a little differently. Um, Julianne, will you lead us off here? Sure, absolutely. Um, this, <laughs> this is like my drum in any panel conversation or anything, which is metrics and accountability. Accountability, accountability. Because Lauren, to your point, it means nothing. Actually, just building off the beautiful point you just made is, it means nothing if there is an accountability against that both personal and structural work that has to happen. So when you think about, um, at least for me, uh, thinking about it from an inclusion sort of justice equity lens, right? It's really thinking deeply about what are measures that actually show you you're making progress in this space and actually defining that. And that, um, Lauren, actually goes to your earlier point you made about which it can be different depending on which organization you're in. There's some things that span across and there are some things that are more specific. So really important to get that because then you actually can make sure you're answering the right questions and you're actually looking at data that indicates movement. So that's kind of part of that first part of the journey. I think the other part of it too is how are you doing it at different levels of the organization? So a lot of what we would talk about is, it's great to, it absolutely needs to come from the top of the organization as but, but it also needs to be in the middle of the organization. The bottom up and top down is necessary, right? You have the energy of sort of your most junior employees moving work forward. You have energy coming from the top, but there's a very famous phrase, the frozen middle um, is where, a lot of sort of, as I like to say, equity and inclusion work can fall off uh, the page and why it's so important to be engaging management and leadership at that middle level in an accountability exercise and in their own growth and professional development. Because what it then says, Lauren, to your point, is that we as an organization value inclusion and value this work around equity, social responsibility as a key tenant of great leadership in this organization. And if you are not showing that, then you are not on the path of great leadership in this organization. And then you've got to then hold accountable against that. And so when I think about accountability metrics and I think how it plays out, that's where my mind goes because that's where you actually start to see the needle shift. Um, and that's in addition to all what I would call the basics bread and butter, like representation, actually having people in the shop. But then of course, retention becomes the big question and retention only happens when your culture shifts and how culture shift happens is with that accountability and particularly at that middle management leadership level, because that's where the rubber meets the road. And so for me, that's kind of the different parts of the equation when I think about how do we actually hold ourselves accountable to this? How do we actually have a plan that we can see over time? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Susan, you want to go next and then Lauren? Sure. I mean, you know, obviously you start with the numbers. That's one way to measure success. So if you look at the uh, environmental side, you look at emissions and say, I had this level of emissions today and I want to get to this lower level tomorrow and eventually get to zero. Um, so there's the real accounting of that. And, and uh, Phoebe, to your point, that is real and that is now being filed and disclosed by many corporations and looked at, scrutinized, and we're being valued based on, on those metrics. And then on the diversity side, of course, it's you know how many um, women, people of color, and so forth do you have at, at various levels of your organization, and, and those are the numbers. So, so there's a need to count the numbers on the one hand. But then I think almost more importantly, there's also the issue not around just quantity, but quality. So you can have diversity in numbers, but you can have an exclusive environment, an environment that is not inclusive. And so that is not measurable by saying this number's reached, therefore we have reached heaven, because it may still be an environment that is not open, that is not allowing people to bring their full self to work and is not truly equitable. And so we, you know, at Comcast, we had a net promoter score type of evaluation of ourselves where we would say there's the numbers, but then there's, how does it feel to work here? Would you recommend this place to anyone else? Why or why not? And sort of how does it feel to be here? And on the environmental side, we can have all the, you know, on-site solar and energy efficiency and electrification of our vehicles as we can, but somebody may go to the, the break room and say, then why do you have styrofoam cups here? And why are you using so much plastic? 
you know, and, and that may be a small part of our emissions, but the quality of life at the company doesn't feel like we're really that sustainable. So it's, it's how do people feel living in that environment as well as what is it like from a numerical perspective? And I think both of those things are metrics. One is a little harder to measure, but is not any less important. And I'd argue maybe more important. Excellent. Over to you, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, Susan, I mean, both of y'all just hit the nail on the head. And I think um, I'll start with kind of where you left off, Susan, with this idea of the, you know, how how to leverage the qualitative nature of the of the kind of data you're collecting to one, just, you know, tell your story, tell your impact story. Um, and two, to kind of fill in the gaps between, you know, what might be happening on a quantitative level. Because I think what happens is, you know, as we've moved beyond some of these like vanity metrics, right, that people have been so comfortable using, like, oh, we give this much money away to this organization and that's it, you know, or we have this many black people at the organization, that's it. No one knows how those black people are doing. No one knows how you got that money to write that check to that organization. You know, it's just like these vanity metrics that have really kind of um, stood in the way of us really deeply interrogating like how it is that we're actually moving a needle um, as it relates to, you know, our, our organization. Um, and so what, what happens is, is that, you know, you, you can look at something and say, oh, well, 76% of the organization loves working here and they feel really great about, you know, having visibility into the leadership and all these sorts and they feel they have growth opportunities. But what happens to that other percentage of folks that kind of were like actually having a terrible time and like hate being there are on the verge of leaving. Um, and what happens is when you focus on these kind of quantitative metrics, you know, oh, we're good, we're good. You know, 76% is fine. That's a C, you know, at, at school, you know, like C's get degrees. Um, you know, you forget about this like huge chunk of people um, that actually would probably be the people that help you solve some of the problems that you're having from an inclusivity perspective, uh, or even from a product development from a marketing perspective or whatever issue that you're dealing with as a company. Um, and so what it looks like kind of for, for me in my world is I really wanted to push our organization beyond those vanity metrics. I wanted us to think about what are the major buckets that we can specifically and um, uniquely demonstrate that we're having a profound impact on a number of stakeholders. So whether that be our customers, so looking at things like our financial health, like, you know, perceived financial health of our customers, both qualitatively and how they perceive their own financial health. And then from the data perspective, what we can see in terms of the, the metric, the data that we collect, you know, as, um, you know, they're, they're engaging with our product. Um, everything from uh, custom, uh, um, you know, employee engagement, you know, again, everything, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, representation, um, sentiments, and, and, you know, engagement and programming across the organization, capturing all of that and keeping a strong pulse on that. Um, our community impact in terms of our kind of strategic philanthropy um, and investments and giving back into our customers. So like tracking that and demonstrating how that is actually making a difference in their lives. Um, and then we also, you know, things like governance and what does our board look like? And what does our, what does our team look like? Are, um, um, and, and how to kind of think back. And one of the things that we think about a lot too at Dave is that, you know, we can't do anything for our members if our business isn't doing well. And I think that forces us to kind of challenge that that supposed inherent tension between profit and purpose. And it's like, we actually have to do well at our company in order to deliver value to our customers. But what we cannot do is do well by exploiting them. We can't do well by, uh, per, you know, being predatory. We can't do well like that just, and so we want to prove that you can actually build this beautiful, wonderful, impactful value bringing business without like, you know, just taking advantage of people, you know what I mean? And so you can start looking at, you know, your core business metrics of your, your, your retention and, um, you know, the, the length of your, you know, um, you know, how often customers come to your product and those sorts of things as these proxies for things that are specifically impact metrics. So when we think about how long it takes for someone to move, for example, from our advanced product into our banking product, that means that they are taking less, you know, they're less likely to be involved in a, in a cycle of kind of meeting in advance to, to, you know, supplant, you know, their, um, finances and are in a much better financial place. So we can look at those metrics that are core to our business and also say, and also this is impactful to our customers because we're helping them move along this journey into financial health and stuff like that. Um, and then, gonna, oh, I'm, go if ahead. You, if you have one more thing, I was just going to try to summarize what you said, which was so great which is moving from vanity, you know, to, to substance, you know what I mean? To, so I love the concept of sort of moving from vanity metrics to those that are really 
substantive that moved the company forward in a very meaningful way. So I don't know if I captured that from you or not, yeah. Yeah. but I'm conscious that we need, uh, we're gonna try to save time for um, audience questions, but there's, there's a question that I really must ask you. And so um, with your indulgence, um, where do you see CSR going in the next three to five years? And we're, you know, I mean, my goodness, we're in this COVID world where we can kind of see post COVID. So sort of thinking about where are we gonna be post COVID and where is this gonna go? Have, have we fundamentally changed either because of the effects of 2020 and the, and the pandemic or what do, what do you see ahead? I think that'd be really important for our audience to, to get the benefit of your thinking there. And I'm gonna start with Susan. So I think that, you know, CSR has now become a must do, not a want to do kind of do someday thing, because companies are going to have to show that they're value driven to be able to attract people to them. Because I think we've, we've now known, we've lived over a year in a more value driven way. I think we've been at home or not at work in a traditional way. And we, I think more than ever know what matters We've had a front seat to the world stage undistracted and watched as, as such terrible things unfolded as George Floyd and, and food insecurity and all sorts of suffering, but also a lot of joy and happiness and connection. And so the humanity that we've come, become used to is something that we're going to look for as we make decisions like where to work. So CSR is going to be more important if you want to attract people. CSR related things are things that investors and others are going to be measuring companies on. So again, another must do. It's going to be the reason that customers buy from you. If they see that you have the same values as they do, they're going to be driven in values in terms of how they, well, who they buy from. And so I think it's just going to be more important than ever for companies, for organizations to be invested in social impact and social good. I think we'll go to Lauren next. Um, no, I totally agree. I think, you know, 2020, I, I, I speak of things in terms of pre and post 2020 at this point, because um, it really is this kind of like shift moment that we've, we've seen we cannot go back from to your point, Julian. Um, I think one of the things that I want to caution, though, is that, you know, uh, old habits really do die hard, you know, and there are there is a, a, a group of people that still benefit from the status quo, and they will, you know, fight tooth and nail <laughs> um, to maintain that status quo. And so it really takes this concerted effort and um, power in numbers for people to really be integrating this work into their organizations, demanding that their leadership take responsibility for this stuff, making sure it's integrated. Um, and, and so like, as we think about like, it's, it's not gonna be an easy kind of transition, that's for sure. It's gonna take the imagination that we talked about earlier. It's gonna take centering of, of communities. Um, and it's gonna take just some really um, groundbreaking work to, to make sure that we maintain and sustain this work and integrate it across organizations, across sectors such that it doesn't, um, you know, that it has that kind of longstanding and sustainable kind of outcomes that we're, we're really hoping for, so. Great, so thank you. Over to you then, Julianne. Yeah, I couldn't agree more more with uh, Susan and Lauren. I mean, I think I think the critical moment here is that we are we're moving from a moment to a movement, and um, that requires uh, sustainability both of thought and strategy. Um, and we're at the point where uh, those of us who were already exposed right to the inequities of this world have people who have joined us who have seen the cracks up close and personal. And that's what the pandemic has done, right? You've seen it written about so much. Um, and, and that's across, right? Everything we can think about in our society, right? Because inclusion and justice and all that, that is across the board. Um, and um, I think, uh, Lauren, to your really well-made point, um, I think um, this is also in so many ways, and I said at the beginning, I, I think about coalition building. Um, I think this is about us reaching in different ways across our identity groups, um, the, the buckets and these colonized ideas of, of where we've been put over time and saying, actually, we've got to work together to get this done. Um, and in many ways, it's for our very survival, collective survival, not individual. Um, and I have to say for Americans, that's a particularly hard idea, this idea of collective <laughs> action and notion. We're quite individualistic <laughs> in many ways. Um, and um, uh, in terms of like the American ideals and what we've taught. And I think 
this is opening up a moment um, for us, um, and I, I, see, I say this from a US perspective, to really open up our thought process. And to your point, um, both Lauren and Susan, imagine what this could be and where we could go and that it's greater than any other place and place and space that we have existed. And I think it's envisioning in that way that we move forward. I think what, um, because Lauren, you're absolutely right. People who have had power are gonna hold on to it for dear life. And that's a very small finite group of people. And there's a whole lot more people than that, right? Who exist in the world. And so then it becomes about that visioning so that those folks actually also come along for the journey. Because at the end of the day, it is actually gonna take our collective action, our collective pocketbooks in many ways, and um, the actions of different companies and different organizations also come together across industries. We didn't talk about it today, but I also think we need to be learning from each other in a much deeper way. I think we've acted in silos for a long time and we've tried things and we've experimented, but we haven't shared what that experimentation looks like, what has happened out of it, what have we learned? And in fact, I think the movement of transparency is hopefully gonna get us there where we can mm -hmm. actually be working across mm -hmm. sectors to actually learn and build together as opposed to in our silos. And I think that's gonna be another critical thing that I hope comes out of this moment and, uh, and a reimagining of, of what it means to collaborate out of this moment. Bravo to all of you. Um, Sophia is gonna be our questioner um, because um, she's getting the questions that are coming in from our audience. So um, Sophia, if you wanna um, list them off and then um, anyone can join in with the answer, yeah. but turn it to you, Sophia. Thank you guys so much. What a great discussion. Just thank you again. Um, okay, so let's start with uh, Pranav. Do you wanna come off mute? Let me find you and ask your question. Hey, thanks Sophia for organizing this and Phoebe for moderating. Um, my question's for Lauren. An overwhelming amount of financial assistants have masculine names. Marcus, Dave, Clyde, Albert, we can go on. Uh, whereas service-based assistants are female gendered, Alexa and Siri. It sounds like this is reinforcing gender bias. Lauren, is there a responsibility maybe to rename Dave and how do we look at branding? I, that's a fantastic question. I'm smiling and laughing because this is something we literally talk about every day, every single day. And, you know, our origin story, and I won't bore you with so many details, but our origin story um, is very much around this idea that we're taking on the big banks. And so is this David and Goliath. And then also our, our logo is a bear and the idea of this, this cute fuzzy bear being like your name, Dave, being like your financial best friend. Um, but I absolutely agree with you. There's, there are these deep seated, um, you know, assumptions that, you know, a lot of organizations are making across the board, no matter kind of what sector you're in. Um, and exactly to your point, you know, we have to be challenging these things that we take for granted, you know, where we think that like an assistant's voice should be a woman or that your financial best friend has to be a man, you know, or someone who identifies as a man. Um, and so we, I think we do have a responsibility to like have the conversations and build the safety and infrastructure to um, interrogate that stuff both internally and then have the conversation externally as well. Um, because I, you know, we can't say that we're looking to disrupt an entire system that has been really predatory in all these different ways in terms of like financial access and things like that. Um, and then turn away from having a uh, discourse and other things that we, we should be, you know, responsible for. Um, so I, the, the answer is, I don't know if we're going to change the name anytime soon, but it absolutely is one of the things that we are um, building into our culture of the company to be able to have those conversations and to effectively think about how do we, you know, strategically think about um, how do we support our members in ways beyond just kind of the services that we can give them from a financial perspective to, to make sure that they feel that we see and hear them um, in those sorts of ways as well. I hope that, I hope that answers your question, but it's, it is an ongoing back and forth conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank it you. reminds me, yeah, it does remind me of the speaker this morning, you know, Martin who became Martine. And so it's too bad that Dave can't, you know, become Dave Via or something. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> next question um, from Sophia. Thank um, you. Yes. Yeah. So next question was submitted and not, oh, actually Nina's just got upvoted. So Nina, do you want to come off mute? Let me find you. Okay. 
Great. Hi there. Um, thanks for taking my question. Um, so I'm wondering, how can someone who is not a manager implement change related to inclusion, um, especially as the only person who might be not in the majority in that department or company? I can start on that. Thanks for your question. Great question. Um, I think, you know, we didn't talk about allyship. Um, we didn't talk about mentors and sponsors, but um, I think at the end of the day, you know, to have a stronger voice would be to sort of team up with others that can help lift up um, your voice and others that are not often heard or not heard at all. And so, you know, one thing that's always worked for me is connecting myself to an ally who's above me, who can be my champion. Um, and that has helped me open up doors that I maybe can't open myself. Um, I also think that there's a lot of room for employees to organize themselves nowadays. And, you know, we have employee resource groups at many companies nowadays. Sometimes that happens organically. It's not like it comes from above it, you know, and leadership says, says you must do this. A lot of times employees band together and say, you know, this is a need of ours. We'd like to have this kind of convening. And by the way, it's great for business and it's great for the company and the community that we serve. Um, so in either way, you know, it requires you to team up with others and to create kind of a critical mass around a particular need. Um, and then the mechanism to do it could either be to detach yourself to somebody above or just to kind of have like a, a cast of thousands. But I think in both those scenarios, it, it still helps to have a, an important ally. So I would, I would connect yourself with uh, somebody that can open those doors for you. Great question, great answer. Sophia? Okay. Um, next question came in unanimously, so I will, or anon anonymously, um, so I'll read it out loud, but thank you all for being here. What advice do you have for a woman at any age or stage starting in a career who wants to be a force for good while also taking on projects that will help close the gender pay gap? I'm just going to give it to any one of the panel. Julianne, you should start. Since yeah, you have yeah. yeah, yeah, we all unmuted at the same time. I was like, that was perfect. <laughs> um, well, first of all, yes, to just you asking that question and thinking that way. Um, I think my, my instinct is, um, first of all, um, I just, on the journey, um, Susan, by the way, I couldn't uh, have agreed with you more on the sponsorship piece and on, on connecting uh, with somebody in the organization who sits at a different position. I think actually the last question and this one are a bit related. I think it's about, first of all, finding your own voice in what you really care about when it comes to gender justice. And there are many, because we're all here, there are many topics to tackle, right, in that space. And I think part of the question for yourself is, what am I really excited about? What motivates me, gets me out of bed when I'm thinking about what's wrong and what could be better and right in this world? Um, and if it's gender pay equity, right, then what I would do is at a personal level, first of all, is I would do research and I would read up and I would connect and I would attend events. And thankfully in our virtual world, it actually is a much easier thing to do um, to actually educate yourself on where is the current conversation on that? Where, what are things going on in your particular industry and who are leaders or other people that you admire who are really getting some work done um, and connect with them. I, I have found actually people cold email me on LinkedIn all the time and I will respond and connect with them if it's a well thought and crafted note, I often respond. And I'm sure I'm not the only one, Susan and Lauren are shaking their heads too. So I would say on that note, those are, I think the personal things that you can do. And then in the company, I think it then becomes, uh, Susan, a lot of your advice you were giving about how to make change in an organization, right? It's joining up in the women's network uh, within your organization. There are, are probably, there is probably usually one. And if not, man, you can start one ladies, let's do it and bring the dudes along for the journey. I cannot give enough advice around that. Um, and then the other piece of the puzzle is again, to seek out um, and find those leaders, um, particularly women that you admire who are speaking on the topic, if it's somebody like Susan or Lauren or me, and, and connect with us, much in the same way you might connect with somebody on the outside who's um, going for this, and start to sort of build out that network and also your own skill set, and then start to move a conversation forward. Those are the things I would kind of think about as, as you're thinking about growing that, and don't be afraid of your own voice. Number one, 
uh, piece of advice I can give. Your voice is powerful. Your voice is beautiful. And we were actually talking about before we joined this call, how much women are hard on themselves, that we judge ourselves a lot. And it actually prevents our own room because so much of it has been socialized into us. So just remember that you are glorious and that you are bringing beauty and glory into that work. And we need your voice. We need your voice because it takes all of us. So that's my the inspirational bit of, of, of what I would say too. Thank you so much. I'm so excited by this conversation. Okay, um, Michelle was next. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for doing this. This is amazing. So um, I am all in for this moment turning movement and a big part of movements in general. Um, they start from really good questions. So what are some really good questions you would ask middle management that frozen middle as you were talking about um, to find if that organization has like has an inclusive culture or if they're just kind of checking boxes. I can definitely uh, take this uh, this one because this is something I actually practice in um, when I'm like interviewing or when I'm being asked to kind of come on board to a company or advise. Um, and that is to, you know, one of the things that I actually asked when I came on to Dave, I asked my CEO, I said, what is it like to be a black woman at your company? And of course, he's he's not a black woman. <laughs> he is a white man, a, a straight cis white man. Um, and he was like, I don't have an answer to that. And he kind of started going down a route of like, oh, I don't see color. I was like, uh-uh-uh, nope, you see, this is melanin. You have to see this is part of my identity. Um, but what he had done is built a team before I even got there where he could say, you know what, I can't answer that. I want you to have the most robust possible answer. And so here, you should talk to this VP over here, who's this incredible woman who happens to be a black woman, not like from a tokenized perspective, but from like, hey, I just happen to have a woman on this team that's amazing that could answer that question for you. Um, but beyond that, I think like when you think about, because you know, all of this stuff that we're talking about has to impact every single facet of the organization, right? So if you were to ask a middle manager um, who might be on the product team or might be on marketing or something and say, how would you design our product for a black trans woman who has a visible disability, who is also undocumented and lives in a rural community? You know, how would you do that for that woman who is so at so many intersections of oppression, of marginalization, of harm, um, of fear, of lack of safety? You know, how are you building a product to support her? How are you centering her? And you can, and, and not, not to tokenize or not to um, sensationalize someone's experiences, but to really call to attention the ways in which so many people get left behind when you're not thinking about them. And so that is like one of the clearest ways to start to think, see if someone has one, just ever thought about it, two, if they ever, you know, if they are actually kind of engaging in the, in the individual work that it's necessary to, um, if, you know, to go beyond thinking to actually doing that in the company that, you, that you're at or looking to join. Um, but it's a really interesting um, thing to kind of constantly keep in the back of your own mind of like, how am I building something or how am I contributing to building something um, that will make the life of someone who is so marginalized and so other better? You know, and so that's that it's definitely one of the tools that I employ in my own work and in my own life. And you'd be shocked to see some of the answers, good and bad, you know, that people have. And it really is um, a good tool to kind of discern uh, where people or an organization is at. All right. I Others think we're at time. Okay. Yeah. Is there one more question, Sophia? I was just going to say there is a like one or two more questions if you guys are open um, to staying on for a few minutes. Just wanted to be cognizant of everyone's time okay um so then to, can i add something to that last question too because mm -hmm. lauren that was like that was a home run answer i was emojiing you out here mm -hmm. on the screen um the other question i would add is if you work in a creative medium or with creative people you can kind of turn the question a slightly different way it's an inclusive design principle question which is amazing and then you can turn it the other way so if you're thinking about it from a storytelling aspect it's um it becomes about who you're centering the story around. And so the question I often have used with storytellers is I ask, what if, what if, what if this person, this character um, came from this background or lived in this geography or was of this race or was this gender or is gender non-binary, right? 
what would that do to the story? Let's start having that conversation because then what it does is it becomes a positive spin cycle of a conversation into the possibilities and the abundance in identity and storytelling, as opposed to thinking about the check the box exercise. And any filmmaker I know who's engaged in that exercise in checking their own blind spots has absolutely loved it and then committed to doing it on every future project. Because guess what? You get a better story out of it. You get a better, you know, you get a better look, a better view. And at the end of the day, the final product's going to be better. And so, and it's, I have found it to be a tremendous way into the conversation in a creative sense that um, opens up the dialogue as opposed to shutting it down. Um, and um, if that's helpful, or if you're, if you're kind of looking at it from that angle, it's just building off what Lauren said, but from a different perspective. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Carolyn, if you want to come off mute, ask. Hi, thanks. This panel is dynamite and the aesthetics are uniformly awesome too. <laughs> so um, I, you've all spoken to this, Julianne, you really nailed it. Americans cannot wrap their minds around being collective versus individual in, in all the good ways. And I think it's a shame that by orders of magnitude, individual achievement is still rewarded above teamwork or collaboration, even though we pay lip service to it. So I wanted to acknowledge that. My question is, you know, who, which organizations and companies really are excelling in, um, you know, really achieving great CSR, whether it's, you know, from the supply chain to the boardroom to, um, to the carbon footprint. I really want to know. I, I would like to ally myself with companies like that. And I'm not sure which ones are really doing that. Those that are quiet about it might be the most successful in fact. So I can hop in really quickly because I, I typically have a really um, uh, unpopular answer or, or not really uh, an answer that people always go hmm, to this question. Um, so I, I mentioned at the top of the hour that I do a lot of kind of startup advising um, on the side, and I kind of primarily focus on founders, underrepresented founders, so founders of color, women, LGBTQ folks, um, folks kind of at um, different intersections of their identity, um, who traditionally just like haven't had access to the capital, um, financial or social, to, to build and scale businesses. And I am routinely just floored by just the amazing thoughtfulness that these founders are putting into building these like brand new companies. And it's just like, it's the, it's the thing that keeps me going, honestly, every single day. Cause I'm like, Oh, there is a better way. Um, and so you're, you're looking at these founders that are, um, inherently building products that are meaningful and impactful because they're coming from communities that have been decentered and left behind traditionally. They're constantly thinking about what does it mean to build a thoughtful team? They're constantly, um, challenging the, the, the assumptions of, of just taking any type of, you know, investment in, in dollars and things like that. So they're really kind of challenging a lot of these assumptions, like at, like at the same time and in real time. Um, so I'm always like really fascinated by kind of what's going on in the early stage startup space, um, as opposed to kind of looking at who are the kind of behemoth organizations that are kind of these giant titanics that might have like really amazing marketing budgets to make you think that they're doing some really great CSR stuff, but might not actually be doing such great stuff kind of behind the scenes. Um, whereas if you're looking at smaller, earlier stage companies, you can really start to see um, how they're truly baking into their DNA. Um, you know, this work, the CSR work, um, and this, in this impact kind of strategy and, and vision. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a unique answer because typically people don't think about kind of looking kind of towards the earlier stages. Um, but that's definitely where I get a lot of my motivation and inspiration. Um, so I would look at, um, uh, accelerators, incubators that are kind of hyper-focused on, uh, founders of color or founders coming from unrepresented backgrounds to kind of get a lot of that motivation, um, and to see if they're hiring on their teams as well, or looking for advisors. How about corporate America, Susan or Julianne? Well, I was about to say something similar, although I can never say anything as, as well as Lauren does, as it turns out. Um, so we should almost just stop talking. But um, <laughs> I was about to say, you know, in a way, you got to look for companies that are willing to admit that they don't know how to do it best. And so there's a lot of companies that actually invest in incubators that have like arms that are dedicated towards innovation and 
to entrepreneurship and to um, funding the unfunded areas of business, both because, you know, it's an opportunity to invest in underrepresented communities and businesses, and because you actually get better ideas and more innovation and creativity, um, because quite frankly, the creativity and innovation really comes a lot from, from deprivation, from exclusion, from, mm -hmm. from being outside the box. And so in a way, a company needs to say, you know, I'm going to get out of my own way and let somebody else enable, empower somebody else to do this kind of work. I think that that really shows a lot about a company, that, that they kind of are unegotistical in a way about and not feeling that they monopolize the good ideas. So that to me is one example of, of what a good company would do. Sophia, are we near the end here? Julianne, did you want to add Julianne something? Julianne can go. Oh, all I was going to add in is I couldn't agree more with both Lauren and Susan. Um, and it's like, you know, like, let's go. I was like, all right, let's go go home because this is amazing. Um, but like, I think, um, I think Susan, what you just said is really powerful because um, it goes back to some of the earlier points we've made, which is the more transparent an organization is willing to be with their data, with their story and with their failures, to your point, Susan, the more you can actually trust them in terms of that they're actually committed to the long haul. A lot of what we're seeing right now is so performative in terms of people making statements, giving sums of money, which is perfectly wonderful. We need to put the money, but what does that mean on a sustainable basis? And so um, I just want to plus up what Susan said is really look at who is being radically transparent and radically transparent about their failures and willing to fail often. That's gonna really get at the heart of the matter um, because um, those, you know, Lauren, to your point, have great marketing teams, you know, putting out the message, it's glossy, are the first people I suspect that something is not, is not a right, right? Like it's, it's something is afoot. Um, and I think that um, it's really exciting, the movement toward transparency being a marker that you're actually the real deal around it, because my hope is that creates competition for more companies to be more radically transparent so that it becomes more normative. And that's where, you know, going back to the post-COVID kind of conversation, I hope that's where we get to in the long run out of this as well. So it's usually the role of the moderator to sum up what we've heard. I have taken notes and I actually find it profoundly impossible to summarize everything that we've heard because there's so many really great thoughts. Um, gratefully, it's recorded so that if you ever want to go back and do that. But I think if you were to, you know, we have a, we've gone from a moment to a movement. We have a, a mission to um, ask the question, what if, which is profound idea to bring to any situation. What if we did this? Or what if this person, we were thinking about that. And so another uh, takeaway for me, what is the asset that the company brings to this, to the table and to this issue? And so whether or not you are in a company right now or whether or not you're creating a company, if you think about the assets that you're gonna bring to answering this question, I think that's gonna be pretty profound. I hope you all agree with me that we were inspired um, by our three panelists who um, span different industries. Um, and I just can't thank them enough. And I know that if we all came off mute, we could give them a big round of applause, but I don't think we want to do that. So um, let's just um, do this and let everybody know what a great job they've done. And Sophia, are you going to take us out? Yes. Um, thank you guys so much again. Um, Phoebe for moderating and to our panelists and to our attendees. Thank you again for attending. Um, we will now have a, well, now less than one hour lunch break. Um, so during the break, please feel free to join the afternoon break session and network with other attendees. You can join us back at 125 um, for a comedic set to energize yourself before the afternoon programming. So thank you guys so much for joining um, and hope you have a great rest of the day with the conference. Thank you. Thank you.